starting from now, I guess. <laughs> so, um, hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar offered by the European School Education Platform, the European Commission's platform for school education uh, in Europe. Uh, my name is Maria Elena, and I will be coordinating today's webinar. Sorry, Maria Elena, to interrupt you. Uh, we yes. cannot see the slide. We okay. see, Cara, we, we don't see the introductory slides with the information for the participants about the webinar. Okay, I will reshare them. Sorry, uh, Mr. Parla, I have to take control here mm. and share some information. And uh, yeah, once again, uh, sorry for uh, the technical issues and the technicalities here. I hope you can see my slides now. Yes. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for letting me know. So, um, as I was saying, uh, I will be coordinating today's webinar, uh, which is offered by the European School Education Platform. And for this webinar, we, ha we have invited uh, Mr. Karoli Palla, um, and uh, he will he will present us. He will help us explore basically uh, the uh, the PISA project, and uh, more specifically. He will focus on the PISA for Schools project, a sub, a sub project of the main uh, PISA assessment, uh, as every everyone knows. And um, he will share some examples of his own experience um, from the uh, European schools and will help us also better understand uh, the concept of this assessment and how it can help us um, encourage our students and how it can help us to um, support our students uh, during assessments. So um, some technicalities, as I mentioned, this webinar is recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, in due time. And towards the end of it, we will share with you uh, a sign up form, a feedback form, basically. It's a feedback form uh, for us. Um, that will help us underst better understand your experience uh, with the, the webinars. Um, I think I'm not uh, missing something. Uh, please stay with us uh, towards uh, the end of this uh, webinar because we will share with you some upcoming events of the European School Education Platform and uh, we would be uh, more than excited to see you uh, joining them as well. Uh, with no further delays, uh, Mr. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. You Elena. can you can share your screen also. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, so once more. I hope it works now. Can you see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. It works. Okay, I, I, at least for the beginning, and then we'll see. So, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for uh, this uh, webinar which, uh, as uh, Maria Elena said, will um, sort of focus on on a general introduction on PISA in the first place. That will be sort of part one uh, of the webinar. Then uh, I would like to say a few words about PISA for schools, which is a, um, a different product, but based on the same principles, as I will uh, explain in detail later. And in the third part, I would like to show you a few slides about our uh, program, I mean PISA for the European schools. Of course, I will uh, let you know who we are before I go to the, the PISA project because uh, that gives you some background information on the European school uh, system. Uh, I, I would like to start with some apology uh, in a way because uh, I will start with uh, a PISA uh, introduction for beginners. So I, I assume you are not beginners, of course, but there might be. Um, so those who are not um, can take a cup of coffee or something. Um, and quite uh, just anecdotically, I brought it here because I quite often heard people um, say that there must be a connection between the PISA uh, assessment and the beautiful city in Tuscany um, with its uh, very well-known uh, Torre Pendente, um, and uh, I, I heard it quite a few times, even from people in education. Uh, so I, I thought we, we have to clarify something, uh, but before going to that, I was just wondering if there's a connection between PISA, I mean the city, and testing, assessment, measurements, uh, experiments, 
perhaps that gave the idea to some people that there must be connection between the two. And of course, if if I asked you now in a classroom to put one name uh, on a piece of paper in front of you, you would put, of course, the name of Galileo, who did an experiment, a very famous one, a very important one in Pisa using the uh, leaning nature of the tower. And mind you, that was before uh, Newton was born, because Newton born the same year when Galileo died. But of course, we are not talking about Tuscany and uh, the city of Pisa, but Pisa is an acronym, as you all know, is a program for international student assessment owned uh, by the OECD and uh, a program that has been running now for more than 20 years. So let me start, perhaps it's still uh, for, for uh, beginners, uh, so sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Because I saw something. In... Uh, we can hear you and we can see clearly the slides. No okay, um, there was a sign, sorry. Um, so a, a few facts and figures about um, the PISA assessment. Um, as you know, uh, the cohort um, that participates is the 15 year old uh, cohort of students all over the world from the countries which is between uh, 70 and 100 um, who has taken part uh, in the PISA since 2000 when the the first assessment was uh, was run uh, until now uh, it covered uh, more than 100 countries altogether uh, countries and economies we always put it uh, the sort of distinction between two and covered uh, more than uh, uh, 3 million and 700 students uh, worldwide. As you know, it's a recurrent action every three years. Four year was um, uh, taken as a, as a gap between the latest and the one before due to COVID. And it's very important that it's competence based and curriculum agnostic uh, testing, uh, which makes it possible to apply the system applied PISA in all education systems in the world. And it gives a report on the national system level. This is very important that it never gives some uh, uh, detailed information on schools uh, or, or students. The three domains which are tested in PISA are reading or reading uh, competencies, maths and science. Uh, we tend to use the word literacy, reading literacy, mathematical literacy, which means the ability of applying uh, in, in reading maths and science, the knowledge and uh, skills they have in real life situations. And that's very important. I uh, have to underline real life situations. And now I have a, a really big problem because in this presentation there's a lot of embedded Zoom effects and they don't work at the moment. Um, so, um, Marielina, I don't know what we can do about that. Uh, do you have an idea about it? Uh, we can either share it as a screen, have a screen share, or um, yes, maybe you can share your screen instead of uploading the presentation. Uh, so I, but I shared. The, okay, so I. You have I, uploaded, yes, the presentation. Great. Now you share your screen. Okay. Okay. Presentation mode. Okay. Can and you then you. Yes, we it, can see, but we cannot see the zoom in. You will in a moment if it works. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Uh, sorry for uh, for this um, uh, problem. Uh, I left it with real life situations, and uh, in, in piece that it's really important that uh, the knowledge is applied in real life situations. I give you one short example to start with, and I hope you can see the zoom now. We can they, see this clearly. is a typical. Uh, PISA assessment uh, uh, task. It's a situation to friends talking on the phone or talking in the internet, chatting on the internet in this case. One of them is in Sydney, the other one is in Berlin. And the, the question is, 
how they can connect at the same time. So the question is, you can see at 7 p.m. in Sydney, what time it is, is it in, in Berlin? Um, of course, we don't have the time to chat about it. And uh, since it's not a live um, um, performance and, and seminar, we can't talk about it. But I would ask you the following questions. How difficult do you think this exercise is? How many students, what is the percentage of the students who you think could solve uh, this problem and, and how? Uh, we can't do it now, of course, so I give you the answers. Uh, the correct answer is 10 a.m., uh, 10 in the morning, if you like, and the correct answer was given by a bit more than 50% of the 15-year-old students um, in the OECD countries. Whether it's high or low, I don't know. I don't want to judge it. It looks a very easy exercise. At the end of the day, it's not. But you can see what the type of exercises in PISA are. That's why I brought it here. I brought it some more as well, and which I will show you later on. The three domains are tested every three years with a four year gap, as I said, between um, 18 and 22. But uh, uh, PISA is always focusing on one of the domains. So reading was in the focus um, in 2000, 2009 and 18 and maths, as you can see on the screen and then science uh, in the two years. And the next PISA in 25, we will concentrate on science um, again. Um, the domains, of course, uh, are broken down into what we call subscales. Uh, in other words, skills or competencies that make the reading, the maths or the science competence work. And I don't want to go into the details, just for example, if you look at reading, location of information means uh, that the students can find clear information in the text, time, places, relations, uh, people, relations between people, and so on and so forth. Understanding it's a bit more difficult, uh, testing if they understand the gist of, uh, uh, of the paragraph or the text, based on the assumption that many uh, students can read, uh, technically speaking, but the reading comprehension, which is the task, does not work very well. Uh, I will come back to it later how well or how poorly it works in different assessments. And the third uh, is evaluating and reflecting. Judge what you read. Do you believe it? Do you give credit? Is it clear? Is it misleading? And so on and so forth. If you want to go a bit deeper, uh, just in one uh, of these domains reading, you can see here how these uh, subscales are broken down to other subscales, sub subscales, if you like, how students can access and retrieve uh, information, how they can search the relevant part of the text, and so on and so forth. And these subscales can be broken down even more precisely to uh, what we call the uh, different tasks, uh, a goal uh, or target. Um, they are very precise and very useful when you try to improve the students' performances. Additional domains are also um, assessed by PISA, and they are very interesting sometimes. In the first time, the first for the first time, sorry, in 2015, um, the problem solving skills were assessed on top of the three main domains. Financial literacy, uh, how students understand money, how money works, has been uh, added as an additional domain three times so far. Global competencies, uh, how uh, the students understand the world around us. Uh, including problems, including the pandemic, for example, for the last uh, couple of years. Um, are they ready to learn uh, all life long? Uh, how creative thinking works with the uh, children? That was the last uh, additional domain in 2022. And a lot uh, of uh, attention uh, has been paid uh, to psychological well-being, social emotional resilience, sense of belonging, 
the feeling that you belong to your community, to your school community, for example, openness to diversity, growth uh, mindset, uh, which is a very important idea that intelligence is not something set. It changes, it can grow, it can be altered, it can be changed, which would be one of the targets and, and goals of all education systems and so on and so forth. And the next PISA 25 will bring uh, in two areas. One is, uh, for, sorry, foreign language uh, uh, testing, which will come for the first time in the history of PISA, not in the history of PISA for schools, because we did a multilingual testing, as I will explain later. But for the whole PISA assessment, foreign languages will become part of the assessment, which is a revolutionary new uh, domain, uh, of course. And the other one, learning the digital word, which is not new, it has been tested several times, that, that will be one of the extra focuses uh, uh, on top of the three main uh, domains of the next PISA. So we are looking forward uh, uh, to this. Uh, I emphasize that PISA um, uh, assesses real life uh, challenges, how competency works um, with a lot of uh, situations. Just a few situations here for you, um, just to give an idea uh, how students can apply their understandings in everyday um, situations when they have to perform currencies, for example, or deal with the time uh, sphere, as I uh, showed you with the Sydney Berlin problem. Use understanding of science when they read magazine uh, newspaper articles about cloning, for example. Uh, and can they read tables and graphs? So can they uh, understand by reading uh, tables and graphs like this, for example, which I created for you uh, at the first glance, of course, uh, I show you two different graphs, but of course it's not uh, the case. Is the same graph in two different uh, uh, interpretations um, with two different levels on the uh, um, axis. Uh, and if we want to decide if this growth of, of whatever is slight, significant, huge or dramatic, and if you look at the left hand graph, you would say it's at least significant. Uh, if you look at the other one, which gives you the whole scale, of course, you realize that it's it's not really dramatic, not even significant, perhaps. Um, and uh, when you see these graphs in a newspaper article, of course, the interpretation of the newspaper, the interpretation of the journalist uh, works uh, in quite different ways. Uh, I brought you here a real PISA example. Sorry for the small uh, size of the of the letters. Here's the graph and the interpretation by the journalist says um, that um, uh, the graph shows that there's a huge increase in the number of robberies between the two years. And the students have to decide whether they believe it or not. Is it a fact or is it um, an opinion? Um, again, now you have a few moments to to judge and to come to a conclusion that if you if you, if we see this graph on the right scale, the full scale from zero to uh, five hundred and twenty, it's clear cut that the answer is no. Um, we are talking about approximately eight cases on the scale of more than five hundred, so it's anything but huge. It's not even slight. It's it's statistically not relevant at all. And if we uh, try to understand how the students dealt with the exercise, did they buy it? Well, most of them did. Only uh, one fourth gave the right uh, answer. The others looked at the graph, said, is it huge? Yes, it is. It's nearly doubled, which is not true. So this is something when um, a, a, a competence, which is there because everybody knows that eight cases on the scale of 500 is not a huge uh, difference, but how these uh, competences work in a real life context is a totally different uh, story, different talk show. Um, again, just an example of how real life challenges are, are met by, by the PISA. Um, 
And other uh, uh, point and example, mainly in maths, how uh, PISA measures maths and problem solving. You must know that problem solving has a huge uh, literature started by George Poya, um, who made the first model of problem solving, um, where the first thing is that you have to understand the problem. Um, when I talk to students and as uh, director of schools, uh, I, I always did. Uh, and I always told them before exams that sit down, look at the question and understand it. Don't start solving it before you are 100% sure that you understand the question. Because we know from experience that a lot of bad answers, wrong answers, come from answering something different. Uh, the answer makes sense, but it's not an answer to questions. So the first thing, understand the question. Then transfer it into a mathematics problem, the real life problem into a mathematics problem. Find the right tools, apply them, solve the problem, and then retransfer it to the real life uh, context. And again, an example of one of my favorites, I love it. It's about pizzas. Not pizza, but pizza this time. And the situation, again, a clear real life situation. A pizzeria serves two types of pizzas. Um, one of them is 30 uh, centimeters in diameter. The other one is 40. And the price is 30 Zs, 40 Zs respectively. Z is the pizza currency to, for those who don't know. They always use this Z when they talk about money. Um, so if you just look at it, um, this is the, uh, the dilemma. You are sitting there, which one to buy, which pizza is better value for money. And now if you solve this problem, it's the real life situation. You go to the maths, you transfer it to a maths problem and find the right tools. Of course, the right tool um, is the area or the disk. You, you know the formula um, uh, and you, you use this. Uh, um, uh, Archimedes uh, theorem uh, to solve the problem to find that, of course, the bigger pizza is better value for money. Um, as you can see in the graph uh, or in this chart, um, when you apply the solution, you have to make an interpretation as well. So in this uh, um, uh, exercise, the students have to explain why they think that the bigger is um, is better value for money, and they can make a, a general interpretations about um, uh, the, the area and how the area grows. It's not linear, uh, or they can they can just count everything, count the uh, area of the, the the smaller one, the bigger one, uh, divided by the price, and come to a um, in a solution. Uh, so that they can uh, uh, solve the problem uh, and answer the question. Real life, I think uh, I made it you know, quite clear what it means in the pizza, uh, not a pizza, the pizza context. I didn't bring here reading or science exercises because they are much longer and we don't have the time and don't have the space for, for them, but uh, they, they, they have the same uh, methodology and principles find a real life situation, try to understand what's going on and answer the questions. The PISA reports, uh, and we are talking now about thousands of pages, so don't think about the, the small booklet, but thousands of, of, of pages, um, uh, are several volumes, are published in several volumes. And the first volume, volume one, for example, in the report of 2018, which was focused on, on reading, as I said, um, gives you an information, uh, uh, several pieces of information on what students know and can do in reading, maths and science, including the very famous uh, data charts, the uh, league tables, if you like, of the countries, but they include much more, a lot more, to be honest. For example, if you read only this first volume, which is around 400 pages in itself, uh, you can clearly understand the methodology um, and the definition of the different literacies, what we mean by reading comprehension at centre. Uh, you can clearly see uh, what the target population is. It's 15-year-olds, regardless of what type of school they go to, 
which grade they are in. It's plus minus three months, but 15 year old students. Uh, you know very well why, because in many countries, in most of the countries, this is the age when uh, they uh, finish their compulsory education, compulsory schooling, and they may or may not, might or might not enter the uh, labor market. Uh, some of them do, some of them don't, uh, it depends. But this is the last moment when this snapshot uh, can be taken. Um, it gives you a lot of information about the test questions, how they are created, how they work, much more than what I could show you in this few uh, moments, minutes. And uh, it gives you a lot of information on the proficiency scales. And let's stop here for a moment, if you don't mind. These are measures six different uh, proficiency levels. Um, five and six uh, uh, represent high ability. One and two represent low ability. And level one represents the cohort uh, which cannot uh, satisfactorily solve the problems in reading, maths and science. Um, I, I don't want to use the word that they fail the test because you can't fail PISA, but they don't reach the minimum requirement of the age uh, of 15 in any type of schools in any countries. Um, just for your information, it's quite shocking that 25% uh, of the OECD population of the cohort does not reach uh, level two, which is the basic level of ability, but they are below. And it's the OECD countries. Uh, if we look at the non-OECD countries, because in PISA there are non-OECD countries as well, in 18 of them, of the non-ECD countries, it's 60%. 60% of the population on these 18 countries practically cannot read. They might be able to read technically, but they don't understand what they read. And this is quite a worrying uh, phenomenon. Uh, I think we all agree. Um, then uh, uh, a lot of other um, uh, information comes in this volume one because we are still talking about volume one of the PISA report. And if you want to read all the other volumes, um, six all together, we are really talking about thousands of pages plus annexes, data charts, PISA in focus series, which is a series of related studies. Let's concentrate a little bit on the 22, the latest report, which came out in uh, December 23, last December, and some highlights. Uh, they are very important. Uh, one, uh, the first highlight is about there's a significant decline in the results, mainly in maths and reading, as opposed to or compared to the previous PISA reports. Um, and uh, only 18 countries uh, have averages above the OECD uh, average. Um, this is the graph that shows the difference. Um, significant uh, performance drop across the OECD, meaning that in mathematics, the drop represents three uh, fourths of a year, which means that the, if you convert the points in which the performance dropped, it's a loss of time in education on average uh, three quarters of a year. We have to be very prudent here because in different education systems, uh, students develop in different paces, in different uh, 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 ways and in, in, in different uh, uh, speed. But on average, this is uh, the picture. In reading, it's half a year. They're half a year behind as if they were compared to the previous PISA um, uh, testing four years ago. Science is stable in a way. In the other part of the chart, uh, you can see uh, something even more perhaps uh, worrying, that the results in uh, reading and maths uh, declined permanently with some uh, differences between the first time uh, the uh, assessment was made and now. And the difference is around 20 points, and 20 points are roughly represent one year of schooling. 
So the, this is the first piece of report which um, gives you the information of significant decline in performance. Um, if we look at the league table, which everybody loves, there's one uh, fact which we have to um, think about that Asian countries uh, outperformed all the rest of the world in all the three domains, as you can see. Uh, Singapore seems to be uh, unbeatable, and then uh, other Asian countries. And if you look at the top 10 in all domains, apart from Singapore, Macau, Chinese Taipei, Hong Kong, Japan, and Korea, we see one European country, Estonian. Estonia is by far the best uh, European country at the moment, as far as the cognitive skills are concerned, and they are in the top 10 in all the three domains, and Canada uh, uh, as well, but no other country uh, from the whole world. Of course, now I'm talking about the top 10, and we always talk about the top 10, but I have to tell you something, that in other uh, areas, the lower part of the league table, there are significant uh, uh, uprisers, there's significant growth, better, uh, uh, much better, um, averages in countries, just a few of them, like Portugal, for example, or Albania made a, a, a great uh, increase, Moldova, Qatar, for example, Peru, um, and, and Sweden, for example, which uh, is um, a, a European country, of course, and a highly developed country anyway. But um, I didn't want to open this, but OK, it did. Um, uh, this is something that we shouldn't forget. I'm not touching it, but it's uh, um, perhaps um, uh, 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 the computer thinks I'm too slow. Um, so I, I have to speed up a little bit. Um, the relation between the socioeconomic gap um, and the performance remains the stable, uh, the same. But in some uh, OECD countries, it widened, which is worrying. On the other hand, a lot of countries do a lot uh, 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 on socioeconomic fairness, which means that they try to help, and with success, um, those groups of students who are socioeconomically uh, uh, disadvantaged. And the difference between the uh, well-to-do and the disadvantage is shrinking in many countries like Canada, Denmark, Finland, Hong Kong, etc. You can see I don't want to read them all. But in other countries, uh, the, the, the gap is, is widening. And uh, I, I don't know if you can read it because it's a small one. Um, uh, there's one important thing. Uh, we always say that it, it's a question of money. Now, uh, it's not. Because if you can see in this graph the difference, what Estonia invests in, in, in education and Qatar invests in, in education, which is six times more, uh, it does, it's not represented in the results. Up to a certain level, money is very important. Uh, above a certain level, it's, it's no longer uh, the most important factor. There are many other factors. Um, I put together a list, and I don't want to stop here uh, because time flies, um, of very good advice to all policymakers, either on national level or on school level. Um, and this is proven by the PISA 22, that the longer schools are open in a pandemic situation, the better. Autonomous learning is very important. Uh, digital devices have upsides and downsides regarding education. The school family relationship is, uh, is extremely important. The later uh, age selection of different education programs, the better. Support instead of repeating the year, uh, that's my favorite, uh, because I've been uh, speaking about it for 100 years now, that support can avoid repeating the year, which makes no sense, I mean repeating the year. Peer-to-peer -peer tutoring and school autonomy and many others. Of course, everything uh, in the reports is detailed and explained. The second part, PISA-based test. What is the PISA-based test? I don't have to repeat a lot of things here because the PISA-based test for schools is um, applies the same methodology, same year group, age group, etc., etc. The main difference is that the report comes 
on school level. So the schools get the information that they need if they want to um, to raise their standards or if they want to improve the school life and community feeling, sense of belonging and other things. Um, in, in the PISA reports, you can read about your national uh, statistics, but you can say, oh, my school is different. Here you can't. This is your school, full stop. Uh, the schools get a very detailed report um, um, with the levels in different areas of competence, comparative benchmarks, which is important with the main PISA results. You can place yourself on the chart, a background questionnaires, interpretation and analysis, um, a very rich uh, database which the schools can work on if they feel like. And uh, I think the most important uh, information on the added value by the school, which I want to show you here, it's perhaps a, a little bit complicated, but in this chart, uh, the line uh, represents um, uh, the reasonably expected results of the school based on the economic, social and cultural status of the students, uh, which is uh, abbreviated to ESCS. So uh, on the vertical uh, axis, you can see the score. On the horizontal, you can see the socioeconomic background. And the schools are supposed to sit on the line or a little bit above the line. If they are below the line, um, that means that the school does not have really added value. So if you look at this school, for example, and the other one, uh, they have exactly the same performance level. But in the blue school, you can see quite significant added value by the school. They are higher than expected, while the red one is lower than expected, no added value, or if you want to put it this way, the added value is negative. And this gives you a snapshot, OK, you have to do much better because you are supposed to be higher uh, on, on, on the chart. If you look at the difference between those, these two schools, uh, the one on the left is an excellent one. The one on, on the right is a, a really poor one. So there the management and the teachers have to work a lot. The European schools, um, we are a small school system. Um, and the facts and figures now are on the chart. Um, uh, how many schools, how many students? The most important one I want to concentrate a little bit on is the language teaching. So we teach uh, all 24 official languages of the EU, 22 of them as mother tongue, language one, or dominant language, if you like. And uh, we have 20 different uh, language sections, now nearly 21. A language section is a school in a school. It's a small school in the big school. So if a, a European school has 10 language sections, that means that they have 10 schools in one uh, because they teach in 10 different languages and they teach uh, second languages and third languages, which I will show you in a minute. Um, just for very short, this is one of our Brussels uh, schools in, in the, the district of Laken in Brussels. Um, and the structure of studies uh, comes with nursery cycle, two years, then a five year primary and seven year secondary ending in the European Baccalaureate, which is recognized uh, in all uh, EU countries by law, but practically it's recognized all over the world. Um, this chart, which looks quite complicated, shows you the language teaching, teaching languages um, in the European schools. Um, um, on, on, on the ribbon uh, at the top, you can see the, uh, the years from primary one up to secondary seven. And you can see that students start, of course, the learning mother tongue at the first primary, but they immediately start uh, studying the first, first foreign language, which we call R2, second language. Uh, the second language is either German or English or French in, in our system. They study these two languages in uh, five years, and then they start studying the third language in secondary year one, 
And then in secondary year four, they may start studying language four. This is not compulsory. The first three are compulsory. And if that's not enough, uh, they can add a language five. So the fourth foreign language in year six. They can take the back in four languages if they like. They cannot sit the back in language five. And uh, on top of that, uh, at certain ages, certain school years, they start studying subjects in the second language. First is human science, religion or ethics in year two, um, in, after year two, year three practically. And from year four, they study history, geography and economics, which is an optional subject. But if they take it, they will study it in the second language. So as you can see, the second language, the importance of the second language is becoming more and more heavy, more and more important in the portfolio of the students. Just in addition, um, uh, students can study other languages depending on uh, what the mother tongues are, other national languages, but it's not very important from our point of view now, which gave us the idea that we can uh, test our children in two languages. Group one took the test in language one, just like all other PISA for schools projects or the big PISA. Um, and these language ones uh, in these cases were broken down into three subgroups, English, French and German. And group two took the same test in the language two, again, uh, English, French or German respectively. So altogether we had six subgroups with a huge difference that group one um, in group one, the language of the instruction of the subject and the test was the same, language one. In group two, um, the uh, language of the instruction was language one, but the test language was language two, which is an extra difficulty because the children who studied maths in, say, English took the test in French, which is an extra difficulty, of course. Uh, this is why we were quite um, uh, 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 worried about the results, not worried, of course, which we wanted to know the results, but we made a comparison between the PISA for schools and the PISA for the European schools. Um, and the main difference is, the three main differences, as I said, that in our schools, 50% of the students took the language, they test in the language two, while in PISA for schools, the majority set it in language one. Second, 40% of the students took the test in a language different from the instruction, which is not the case in uh, other national schools. And 67% took the language in uh, the test in a different language from the one they speak at home, which is again a very important factor in uh, the average of, uh, of the schools um, in, in the piece of schools uh, studies, it's 80% um, of of the students speak the same language at home in which uh, they took uh, the test and in which they are instructed, which makes the difference even uh, bigger. Um, uh, this chart shows something, but it's, it, it's not that important. It shows that the average performance of the European schools in reading maths and science is higher than the average of the OECD countries and the average of the European Union countries, um, which we, we are very happy with that. But of course, we wouldn't say that um, uh, we are an average school. We are not an average school, so we have to uh, take it as it is. We are happy, but it's not very surprising. Uh, the difference between boys and girls is interesting because we don't have the, the gender difference in reading. Normally, the PISA shows uh, a gender difference uh, and the girls do much better than the boys, uh, and we follow the gender difference trend in other schools that boys are better in maths and science. So there's something we have to work on because in many countries, this gender difference is shrinking or disappearing. Um, we, we have our, our uh, homework here, uh, clearly in the subgroups, and the difference between the most advantaged and the least advantaged students um, background wise is too big as well, uh, at least to my taste, as you can see. Um, what was the most important for us? And we learned uh, a, a very important uh, um, thing of ourselves is 
that the difference between the language one and the language two group is not dramatic. There is a significant difference in, in, in reading, but not dramatic. Uh, there is a, a slight difference in maths, but the other way around. Here, the language two cohort did better, higher uh, results, although they took the test in maths in a different language from, uh, from the one they get the instructions in schools, which is quite in interesting and important. And in, in science, there is again um, a, a slight difference, but not a dramatic uh, difference uh, between the two. Um, I don't think that we have the time now to speak about a cohort, which you can see on the on the screen, and like we call them swords. And swords means students without a language section. So these students who don't have a language section of their mother tongue uh, in, in the schools, but uh, uh, they are enrolled in a different uh, section. So let's take an example. There's a school which does not have, uh, say, a Slovenian section. So the Slovenian students will be enrolled in one of the sections, uh, most probably the English, or in the French section if the school is in Brussels or Luxembourg, or the German section if the school is in, in, in Germany. But um, they are allowed to, they have the right to study language one. So they have language one, their own mother tongue, Slovenian in this case, and all the rest is instructed for them in language of the section. And this fact uh, gives some miracle to this cohort, which you can see here, that these students without a language section who take the test in language two uh, simply outdo all the other cohorts, even in reading. Their reading comprehension is better than those students' reading comprehension who did the reading in their mother tongue. The maths uh, is far better and uh, the science is better as well. So this is a peculiarity which we um, start understanding, but we don't understand fully. We are working on trying to find how the, the, the mindset of these, of these children work that makes them absolutely the top students of our school system. Um, it's just a, a, a sort of comparison for you. Uh, I tried to put together the results of our students uh, uh, broken down into language one and language two separately as well. These are the blue um, uh, pillars of the building and then compared it with the OECD and with the countries in which we have schools, uh, European schools. Then I added the highest European uh, result in reading in this case and Singapore, which is the highest everywhere. And as you can see, uh, in reading in uh, 22, Ireland uh, was fantastic. Um, a, a, an excellent result, much higher than the uh, uh, other schools where we have European schools. We don't have a Euro European school in Ireland, by the way. Uh, we have an accredited school there, anyway. Um, when we go on to the mathematics, um, the picture is very similar with the difference that here Estonia has the highest result um, among the European Union uh, countries, education systems, if you like, and very similarly uh, also in science. Um, uh, Estonia is great. As you can see, as I said before, Singapore is uh, unbeatable. But what is most important for us is that our students in language two uh, have the same abilities higher abilities at work uh, than uh, language one tested students in all uh, the European Union uh, countries. Uh, again, as I said, uh, we are not a, an, an average school, um, but I think um, that there are some tricks that uh, we, can, we can publicize better so that uh, people understand how these results were made born. So when we speak the, about the European education area, um, which is a, a huge project of the European uh, Commission um, with the support of the European Parliament, this is something that we can offer. Um, uh, how uh, you can reach such proficiency in your language too. Of course, it takes time because don't forget that the children start studying their language too 
at the age of six. Um, there's a very important background question I added to the test uh, about the student engagement and how they feel at school. I, I won't go into the details, but I want to show you how this socio-economic background um, is uh, is tested and uh, what schools, what uh, sorry, students think and say about uh, the, the motivation, the school climate, the teaching practices, uh, and so on. Uh, if they believe in themselves, what is their self-efficacy? Uh, how do they uh, perceive uh, teaching practices, disciplinary climate, and so on and so forth? And um, how the social and emotional skills work, which uh, are, are becoming more and more important in all the studies in all over the world, especially those uh, uh, huge uh, studies run by the in, by the OECD. And just to finish with uh, how schools can use the data. And uh, now I could cut it very short saying that as they like. Uh, that would be a bit cynical, of course, but but it's true as they as they like, as they wish. In the first box uh, here, you can see uh, something which is given. Um, that after the school test, the BISA based school tests, there's a workshop run by the OECD uh, when uh, they explain how the schools can use the data, what the data mean, uh, how they can assess, and how they can turn the data into action plans in order to improve uh, the school climate or the cognitive skills, at the end of the day, the standards of the school. Uh, there's also an OECD webinar in which um, uh, some more practical information are shared on how to read the school report, what you have to concentrate if you want to get the best of the information flow from the school report. And uh, uh, on top, the schools can join the PISA for Schools online community forum, which is an open forum for those schools who participated in the PISA for Schools, and there you can find partner schools, exchange uh, um, uh, different experiences, exchange good practices, which is very important because we can learn a lot uh, from, from each other. Um, this is online, but sometimes uh, the OECD or, uh, for example, V uh, for our schools um, uh, uh, organized uh, in situ exchanges of, of different methodologies and good practices. And of course, if uh, I uh, think with the head of a school director or a school management heads, um, I would say that I would analyze the results as thoroughly as possible, going down to the subscales so that I find out, just like a diagnosis, where are problems, which are the subscales, the areas where something doesn't work, and then, of course, we can concentrate on that with support, with extra help, extra help for the teachers, extra methodologies for the teachers, and so on and so forth. Uh, the same type of analysis uh, can be uh, drawn on the outcome of the background questionnaire uh, to see the same. How and where uh, in an action plan we can improve things like, uh, like support, like uh, helping the students to have the sense of belonging. And many of the OECD reports say that the sense of belonging is absolutely important. I'll give you one example. Uh, one of the surprises of the last or the latest PISA report was uh, that um, the once a champion, Finland, dropped quite a lot. They used to be the first for years, then they became the first from Europe, then Estonia became came above them, but they will uh, still were the second. And now they have dropped to the OECD average. We don't know why the Finnish will analyze the reasons. On the other hand, when uh, we, we look at um, the belonging, uh, how children feel at home in the school, how children feel safe at school, which is extremely important, how they think that the school is their real home, second home, as we put it, Finland has excellent, excellent outcomes, together with countries like Switzerland, for, for example, 
uh, or Austria. On the other hand, Ireland, uh, which uh, came up very well in the cognitive skills, has a long way to go to improve the school community feeling and the sense of belonging. And the same applies to other countries, uh, just for example, the, uh, the United States. Again, just an example. And of course, in the school, you can have pedagogical discussions, study days, conferences, small pedagogical chats, as we call it, uh, and whatever you like. You can find partner schools, invite them, visit them, and so on and so forth. So when I said the schools can do anything they like, I meant it really. I thank you very much for your attention and time. And I think uh, Maria Lena uh, collected some questions, perhaps, although I didn't leave too much time for the questions. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, from our side as well, Mr. Parla. Uh, let me um, share uh, my slides here. Um, so uh, basically, we have received some comments. Uh, and uh, most of our participants uh, mentioned that uh, it's a very uh, contradicting topic that still raises contradictions, the PISA topic and the PISA assessment. Um, so I don't know if you if you would like to um, elaborate uh, a, a bit on that, because indeed, sometimes when we think about PISA, we only think of the very uh, of the initial test is a test the assessment one the one that assessing competencies and we we don't know a lot about the PISA for schools which basically assesses uh, its school uh, individually it, it assesses uh, the social economic background as you mentioned some emotional aspects and maybe uh, it can help uh, teachers and schools and enhance uh, uh, the well-being of the school community and, uh, of course, the well-being of their students and the academic achievement. In a, I don't know, would you like to elaborate a bit on that? We have a few minutes left. Um, well, uh, I would be happy to do so. Uh, uh, in, in fact, I, I, I would have to know what contradictions people think um, or controversions people think when, when they say that. I know that um, just like all systems, PISA is not without criticism uh, either. Um, why I think it's still important um, on, 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 on the national level, I think uh, it, it's really important that decision makers um, have um, a snapshot about their systems. Um, so if you are from a country and you look at the results, um, you can see that, for example, Supporting the students is very important to make them feel at home. Uh, a shocking example is that the Ukrainian children, the, most, the vast majority of the Ukrainian children reported that they are safe at school and the, 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 the teachers do as much as they can so that they feel safe at school. And you all know how important that is. Um, during the pandemic, schools reported that well, Teachers dealt with the children a lot online, uh, the, uh, the performance raised. But if they also ask questions about how the students were, how they felt, uh, it gave a huge amount of feeling of belonging, which always gives, uh, um, a, a, is always a booster uh, um, to performance. Um, what, what I wanted to ex emphasize to you is that PISA is not about the league tables. Uh, that's most in, in, interesting, I know. Everybody clicks on that, who is first, who is second? But a huge amount of information, which I try to show you, of course, in a, in a nutshell, the thousands of pages I was talking about, gives a lot of very important uh, insight to, to the education systems. And um, I, I think uh, in different levels of decision-taking, uh, this is a huge amount of, uh, of ammunition uh, to those who are responsible uh, for taking the decisions. Thank you very much. And one last question uh, that came through the chat. Um, how can a school apply for participating to PISA for school exams? 
Um, if um, uh, it, it's a very good question and, and it helps me to finish uh, what I, I wanted to say and I forgot that if you are interested in, in the results, you click on uh, PISA OECD website and you will have all the information. Uh, I mean, the, the thousand pages uh, uh, of, of each uh, um, the PISA run. And if there you you want to find a PISA for schools as a segment of the website, uh, you can find how you uh, have to apply, how you can uh, uh, apply. And, and then uh, you get in contact with the PISA for school administration and then uh, they will be very happy to give you all the information you need how to apply. Of course, uh, it's it's not schools themselves who apply in the first place, but countries or school communities like a county, for example, or a, a big city can uh, can do that. Uh, for a school in itself, um, it it makes doesn't make much sense. But if someone is coming from from a, a decision taking body in a in a city, uh, they can say, okay, let's try how our city performs. Where are we in the in the country uh, performance wise? Where are we in Europe? Or where are we in in uh, in another country in in Africa or the Americas? So OECD uh, PISA website, everything is there. Great, thank you so much. So we have shared the links uh, in the chat so you can find more information about the PISA and the PISA for schools. And before we close, uh, give me a few minutes to introduce you to uh, the upcoming learning events on the European School Education Platform. Please feel free to click on the links. Um, you can uh, uh, enter the European School Education uh, Platform website and you can find all the necessary information about the upcoming courses in the upcoming webinars. Uh, please don't miss uh, our upcoming webinar on education law and ethics uh, on Thursday, this Thursday, in two days. And um, I would like to close here uh, thanking you, Mr. Palla, uh, thanking my colleague Marta, and thanking every one of you uh, for participating uh, in this uh, webinar offered by the European School Education Platform. Uh, we would be very happy to see you in the future of um, any of our upcoming uh, learning events uh, on the ESEP platform. And I uh, wish you a nice evening all and thank you very much once again. We hope that you enjoyed it. And please don't miss to fill in the survey form uh, my colleague Marta has shared with you earlier in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. Have a nice evening. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.